Hello, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the Natska conference on decolonizing natural sciences collections. Today, I will talk about the lost artists of British Enlightenment natural history, focusing on the collections of the Linnean Society of London. In my role as head of collections at the Linnean Society, I often give tours to members of the public, students in history of science or in biology, or some of our, to some of our fellows. A great deal of the tour, which lasts about an hour and a half, focuses on Carl Linnaeus and his collections of books, manuscripts and biological specimens, which are kept in our collection store. Walking through the building, I talk about our most famous fellows. On the left, uh, James Edward Smith, who bought Linnaeus's collections and founded the Linnaean Society. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, whose paper on evolution was first read at the Linnean Society in 1858, or Robert Brown, whose microscope we own and with which he discovered the Brownian motion. While I make a point of talking about the women who fought to become fellows of the society at the turn of the 20th century, the history I tell is a traditional white male scientist kind of story which is unsatisfactory to some of the audience we get or to the audience and new fellows we want to attract. Lately, museum curators have been calling and striving for more diversity in the museum. And for me, Miranda and Subhadra's paper in uh, the uh, journal uh, of Natska um, has really opened uh, my eyes about decolonizing natural history collections because it really also applies to library and archives. Being a small learned society at the Linnean Society, we are limited in what we can do. And a lot of what we have been doing in the past couple of years has focused on events. So for example, we had an event on women fellows who which looked back uh, at the first 15 women fellows um, back in 2018 and an event on diversity within natural history in March 2019. And for both of these events, we had displays in the library, which used our collections to kind of root that uh, theme of the event within the history of the subject. Researching for these opened my eyes to what should have been obvious from the start. While our collections are predominantly the archives of white male fellows, there are sections of our collections which relate to women, and to black and ethnic minorities. It's a question of knowing where to look in the collections. Yes, we do have some of Ferdinand Bowers or James Sowerby's drawings, but many of the scientific illustrations we have are by anonymous artists. These, their illustrations were commissioned from fellows of the Linnean Society. These fellows came from varied backgrounds, including surgeons, medical doctors, reverends and army soldiers. They were part of the British colonial enterprise, exploring and settling in Burma, Nepal, India and the West Indies. Their observations about the botany and zoologies they studied were sent back to the society to be read to other fellows at meetings and published in the society's journals. Yet the artwork accompanying these observations was not generally drawn by the authors themselves, but, but by indigenous or local artists. The collection of natural history material was therefore much more multifaceted and complex than it appears at first. When these drawings or illustrations are catalogued, they are generally catalogued under the collector's name. Yet in an archives catalogue, and here we see the back end of uh, CALM, which is our the Linnean Society uh, archive catalogue, what we call the author is termed the creator. And the creator of a work of art is its artist, not the collector or the compiler. So it is unsatisfactory in archival terms to have collections of drawings which are known only by the collector's name. And in the example shown here, the creator should not be Francis Buchanan Hamilton, but the Bengali artist Haludar. Unfortunately, the identities of these artists remain unknown in most cases but scholars have recently begun to highlight their importance in the construction of natural historical knowledge in Enlightenment Britain. The images they drew to accompany textual descriptions of new plants and animals were often the first to be seen in Europe and sometimes accompanied biological specimens, so their value is both historical and scientific. 
These artists were steeped in their own visual and technical uh, traditions, yet they were expected to conform to Western standards of depicting plants and animals that mirrored taxonomic and nomenclature, nomenclatural objectives. The resulting works reflect the meeting of different cultural, sociological and ecological concerns. And I will um, highlight uh, this by giving three examples of drawings and illustrations which are in the Linnean Society collections. Two are from India and one is from the West Indies. We start with uh, the collection of Major General Thomas Hardwick, who was an English soldier and naturalist, um, and he was in India from 1777 to 1823. He had a military career with the British East India Company Army, and he was a fellow of the Linnean Society who regularly submitted papers to scientific societies in both Calcutta and London. And the two examples I have from his collections here are papers that he sent to be read at meetings of the society and which were accompanied uh, by a painting. So, for example, this image of a red panda is dated January uh, uh, 1821 and is drawn from a specimen received from Nepal um, and was known only by its Nepalese name, Wo, uh, according to Hardwick. Uh, Hardwick believed the animal to be a marten, and he sent an article about it to the Linnean Society with the painting, but unfortunately for him, the paper was only read in 1827, which uh, meant that uh, this, despite the fact that this is probably the first image we know of a red panda in, um, in uh, Europe, uh, Cuvier had pre preceded uh, Hardwick uh, and the, the paper fell into oblivion. His painting of a reticulated python is dated December 1821, and the accompanying paper was read in 1823 at the Society. The animal was drawn from life by an unknown Indian artist, much like the Red Panda, who was trained in the schools that had sprung up in Calcutta to paint for European officials and their families. Hardwick kept his own private menagerie, and the python appears to have been a prized exhibit. He observes that the habit, and I quote, the habits of this serpent are very active. It was ready to spring at everything moving near its cage. And he also noted that it ate four chickens, two pigeons, two rats, and one crow. Hardwick eventually amassed an important collection of 4,000 paintings of animals and plants, many of which illustrated species unknown to nat European naturalists, and all of them painted by unknown Indian artists. Many of these paintings are now at the Natural History Museum and we have a small collection at the Linnean Society. And about 200 of them were published in John Edward Gray's Illustration of Indian Zoology, which was published in two parts between 1830 and 1835. My second example is from the Alexander Anderson collection. Anderson was second director of the Botanical Garden of St. Vincent from 1785 to his death in 1811. And we hear, see here an illustration of the Botanical Garden in St. Vincent, which is in our collection. Uh, Anderson mentions numerous artists in his correspondence with uh, William Forsyth, which is kept at Kew Gardens. But once uh, Anderson was director of the garden in St. Vincent, he mentions one in particular who was called John Tiley and whose drawings are now at the Linnean Society and at the Hunt Institute. Uh, and in particular, um, in this letter, we learn more, a little bit more about John Tiley. As Anderson writes to Forsyth, I am getting drawings of all the new species and those not well known. They are drawings by a deserving young man, a mulatto native of Antigua. He has lived with me these 12 months past. It is a natural acquisition he is self-taught. He is also modest and sensible, and I wish he may have encouragement in proportion to his merits. And I think it a pity such talents should be buried in this part of the world, and I wish my finances could afford to take him out of obscurity. If you think he could meet with any encouragement in England, I will thank you to let me know. He is a young lad, about 20, and might suit a gentleman to travel in pursuit of natural disquisitions. Could I afford to give him proper encouragement, I would retain him for some years to travel with me through the island. Would views of landscape of the West Indies sail to his advantage in England? He sends a flower for Miss Forsyth. 
And we do not know what happened to John Tiley. Uh, Dr. Julie Kim for Fordham University is currently on uh, working on him uh, and his life. Uh, we have some of his uh, paintings at the Linnean Society, which he has signed. Uh, and they are detailed watercolours of the tropical plants of St. Vincent, which were uh, undertaken for Anderson's flora of St. Vincent. Some of these drawings include uh, crop species such as avocado in the middle here, or a species of tomato on the right. The last example is Francis Buchanan Hamilton, who was a surgeon naturalist in the Bengal Medical Service and within the jurisdiction of the British East India Company from 1794 to 1815. And he conducted surveys of Mysore um, here in 1800, Nepal in 1802, 1803, and Bengal from 1807 to 1814. His collection of artworks, specimens and manuscripts are found in various institutions. So we have some at the Linnaean Society, but there are also some at the British Library, the Natural History Museum and the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh. And the collection of plants in particular has been extensively studied by two botanists of uh, RBGE, Mark Watson and Henry Nolte. Further research by curators at the British Library and elsewhere has concluded that Buchanan Hamilton engaged a young artist when he was in Bangladesh and he taught him to draw fish and then he took um, uh, him uh, along with him in Nepal and um, Mysore. A manuscript still had held at the Asiatic Society in Kolkata mentions his name, which was Haludar. And Haludar seems to have been part of a group of artists in Kolkata whose art was recently the first of an exhibition at the Wallace Collection, uh, Forgotten Masters. A botanical artist, Claire Banks, is undertaking a PhD project on the Buchanan Hamilton Collection, focusing on what she calls company drawings, drawings done under the direction of the East India Company. And she has been able to determine that these are hybrid drawings. The paper is Western paper, while the materials, paints and pigments are all local. And in the case of Buchanan Hamilton, the um, collection is particularly exciting at the Linnean Society because in some cases we have, uh, as in for this species of orchid, we have the specimen on the left, the painting uh, by the artist, by Haludar uh, in the middle here, and then uh, the publication which copied this uh, drawing so Buchanan Hamilton left all his manuscripts and illustration to James Edward Smith, who only uh, published a few of these in his exotic botany. I want to draw several conclusions from all these examples and finish with these. The work of local and indigenous artists employed by collectors, explorers and scientists was essential for Western understanding and knowledge of natural history. Often, as is in the case for Francis Buchanan Hamilton, we can see here, their artwork was linked to specimens, sometimes type, type specimens, and copied and published in scientific journals or books. As such, they should be recognized, their lives should be researched and celebrated. However, they were often not mentioned or recognized even by their employers, and we see that uh, Alexander Anderson never named John Tiley uh, by his name. And therefore, they remain unknown. Uh, the research to uncover their hidden lives can be time consuming and painstaking and often depends on the archivist actually cataloguing uh, 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 their, this material in a way that will help uh, researchers. Often also, as we have seen, material of a single provenance is dispersed within numerous institutions and sometimes in, in more than one country. Therefore, two factors help. Digitization is one of those which enables links to be made, research to be undertaken, especially at this moment in time when we cannot travel easily. And last but not least, collaboration is essential. Rescuing these uh, anonymous artists and restoring them to their rightful place as creators in archives catalogues necessitates international collaboration between institutions and between heritage organizations and historians of science. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, I think it's a really wonderful uh, talk to end the session on. Um, I had a question come in the chat, I don't know if you've seen it, that it keeps coming up about 
collections management systems and recording this information adequately uh, in a way that our collections management systems typically aren't built for it. So do you have plans to change the way that you use the creator field in cataloging? Um, yes, I hope so. I'd have to speak to the archivist, really. <laughs> uh, but I think, I mean, the, I think the lay, in the case of Francis Buchanan Hamilton, it's a, a relatively recent uh, discovery, um, this, the, the name of the artist. Um, but it, it, in my view, it should be changed to Haludar, and I, I hope we can do that, yeah. But then you need somehow that, that the, um, the link to the fact that it was collected by Francis Buchanan Hamilton to be uh, represented in the catalogue as well. And at the moment, I don't know how you do that. So it, it is a, a bit of a problem in terms of uh, information cataloguing and metadata. Yeah, it certainly doesn't sound like there's many ones with that problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and there's another question that you've mentioned that many of the illustrations are by local artists. How Actually, I'll rephrase this question to my own end, if that's okay. So I find that a lot of the kind of discoveries you talk about, are, for me, have often been made by complete happenstance. So you come across a mention of an Indigenous collector, an Indigenous artist, or not the person who's the white man who's been attributed to. Do you, do you have any um, sense of how people can be more targeted in looking for those? Or is, is it only ever going to be happenstance that we find it? Yeah, and I think this is why I was, I was thinking, when I was thinking about this, it's, it, it is very difficult because it does depend on, uh, I think, the, the, the cataloging process. Um, and, but if you don't have that information, how do you uh, go about finding it? And this is why I'm thinking um, a lot of the time, I think archivists should and, and need to collaborate much more with academic researchers so that uh, that information that is discovered by academic researchers can be included in the cataloging process. Uh, because as you say, um, when I was looking at John Tidy, it actually took, you know, I had to go to Q uh, archives and find the letters from Anderson to Forsyth. And even then I couldn't find his name because that information is not readily available. Um, and I think this is one of the, of the problems we encounter um, these lives are there, we know they're there, but how do you uncover them because they are so hidden in a way? So it is a process of, uh, I think, collaboration between researchers and, and there is more and more research happening on, on, this, on this subject. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that communication of, of the information in the research back to the uh, curators, catalogers, librarians. Thank okay, you, yeah. And just to squeeze one more in if we can, it's a specific question. Um, Heather would like to know more about how local Indian artists were recruited. Oh, that I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, you, I know Claire Banks is in the audience and she would probably know much better. So um, I have to say, I, I'm relatively, this is, you know, quite a new subject for me. Um, so I'm, I'm learning as I go, and uh, I think a lot of us in, in the same situation, possibly. Uh, but I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm relying on people who are doing the research in order to, to, to uh, fill those gaps that I have in my knowledge. Um, I, I believe, and I hope I, I'm not wrong, that these artists were, were uh, trained and recruited from schools of arts that were in Kolkata and that were specifically trained to respond to uh, uh, European demand. Brilliant, thank you so much um, for both the talk and the, the question and answer session now.